Welcome to the Complete Leader Podcast, giving leaders the tools and information they need to grow and change their world. Now here's your host, Dale Dixon. Optimizing strategy for results, laying a foundation. Welcome to the Complete Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Dale Dixon. So good to have you with us. We are joined today, as always, by Ron Price. Good to see you, Ron. And our special guest, Professor Tim, uh, co-authors, along with Dr. Evans Baya, of the book, Optimizing Strategy for Results. And Optimizing Strategy for Results is the focus of our conversations as we now enter into the phase of breaking down this book in looking at each of the seven stages of strategy as detailed in the book. Uh, Our first conversation was a general overview of how the book came to be and why these three authors decided to collaborate on a book from a global standpoint and bring it to us. Our conversation today is to dive into that first stage, which is foundational. So Ron, Professor Tim, Great to have you with us on the on the podcast today. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast player app, uh, so good to have all of you with us. Thank you, Dale. It's good to be with you again. And we're excited about this conversation about preparing the foundation for strategy. So we'll encourage listeners to go back, start from the beginning to get the full understanding of who Professor Tim is, uh, their involvement in this book. Uh, But let's dive in because we're keeping these conversations on the short side so that people can consume them on the drive to work. But uh, we're, we're talking today about the foundation. And if folks want to just get a picture of what the seven stages looks like in a diagram, you can go to optimizingstrategyforresults.com. It's the title of the book as all one word, optimizingstrategyforresults.com. I'm going to open up to the inside page and just show folks what to look for on the website, but it's a graphical representation of the seven stages if you're listening and not watching on YouTube and excuse the coffee stain on the bottom uh, of my page. But we're starting (laughs) with stage one, establishing the foundations of strategy. So what what are some of the key things as we start thinking about this ongoing work of strategy in our organizations? What are the key things that we're looking for, uh, key outcomes for this stage? We, we want to build uh, a framework that's enduring, that is going to be um, lasting and important and be as a compass for us no matter what the external environment throws our way Mm -hmm. or how the business or organization evolves. What Prof said when we first started talking about this is that we're building a foundation that will last 100 years or more. Mm -hmm. So the basic question is, what will make your organization deserve to exist for 100 years? And Prof started us off with a different idea. I'd been involved in strategy for decades, but I'd always thought that the words purpose and mission were interchangeable, that they were synonymous. And Prof said, oh, no, I see them differently. So we had a great conversation about that. I'll let him explain the difference of them. Yes, purpose is the reason for your existence. But when it comes to mission, it goes beyond purpose. It includes the how you will achieve that reason for existence. So... This is, this is the difference uh, between the two. So purpose is one of the, the elements of the strategic foundation. And vision, and it, because of that, vision might, I'm sorry, mission might change over time. The, what really impacted me when he said it, and it, it made me think about those two words in a very different way. Purpose is why we exist. Mission is how we apply purpose to our set of circumstances, mm-hmm. whether it's our customers, our environment. The mission is going to be a lot more specific to the current circumstances, whereas the Mm. purpose is transcendent. And that was very helpful to me. Mm. You know, Prof, um, when I started working with this, now I'm an executive. And so it's my job to help guide an organization through the development of their strategy. Mm. And as we started having this conversation about purpose, what we discovered is that there were three reference points that we Mm. could use Mm -hmm. that would help us get more clarity about our purpose. The first was the founder's story. Mm. So the organization that I'm uh, leading right now has been around for 38 years. So we've got a very rich founder's story and a long history of experiences that reinforced 
the reason that the organization exists. The second thing was our current understanding of why we exist. And for that, we talked to our employees, many of our customers and stakeholders, mm -hmm. and said, why this organization? Why are you a part of this organization right now? What is mm -hmm. the central core reason that you want to be a part of this organization, transcending pay or status or things like that? And then the third question we asked is, what purpose can we define that will last for 100 years or more? So we actually got three different kinds of conversations, and we did a lot of listening. And one of the things that I discovered in that process is that oftentimes we feel purpose before we can articulate it. Mm. And actually, that lines up with neuroscience, which says that this deeper intrinsic sense of purpose is usually something that emerges in the part of our brain that is not devoted to language. And we have to eventually bring it over to the language part of our brain to articulate it in a way that's clear. So it's, it's be, for me, in a real live situation, it's really been fascinating and a lot of fun to have these conversations about purpose. Of course, you know, Dale, we're not doing that in 45 minutes on a Friday afternoon. This is true. In order to do it well, you do it over a longer period of time and you have as many conversations and you keep, keep coming back and revisiting it. And eventually what you're doing, it's almost like you're boiling something down mm -hmm. to its mm -hmm. essence. So, Prof, I don't know if you've had a similar kind of yeah, experience. Yeah, I've had uh, this, this experience that uh, whenever we go to strategic uh, workshops <clears throat> with groups, and we try to define purpose as one of the elements of this, the foundation, we end up not being able to do it in that session. And people get frustrated. But I tell them, don't get frustrated. We, at least we have discussed the elements that could be useful. Then I tell them, think about it for the next couple of weeks. We'll revisit it. And often we revisit it several times before we can come up with at least a working statement uh, that is not necessarily final that could be finalized towards the end of the strategy process so it is something that takes time to develop so purpose is the first element of the foundation then the next one is the vision this is your your dream for the future yeah, yeah and i just want to say one more thing about purpose before we uh, go on and that is that i think you you have really gotten close to what your purpose statement should be when it can be applied universally to all stakeholders mm -hmm. so it's not just aimed at one stakeholder like a customer or mm -hmm. an employee mm -hmm. but it, it it has relevance and resonance with all of your stakeholders, then you're really getting close to something that has great staying mm. power. Mm. And that resonance is an expression of the creation of value. Mm. Your reason to exist is to create value for your stakeholders. And when you can capture that in one statement, uh, you've really got something that's going to last a long time. Matter of fact, I had a chance to do this with a company back in 1989. And um, it took us about a year to keep talking about it and refining what we were saying and to articulate in a way that we could all say, yeah, we think we've got it. This is 2022 while we're making this recording today. That company is still using the same purpose statement. It still resonates with them today. So it's universal and it's timeless. When you get that, you know you've really got something that you can build on. Let me add something to what Ron has just said, that uh, your purpose statement is actually related to your, um, to your value proposition. So normally I would ask uh, uh, organizations to articulate what is the value proposition for the different stakeholders. And that value proposition is what we can then work with to create the purpose statement because it has to be relevant to the various stakeholders. The, the segue out of this, you've talked about some of the tools you use, but I think it's really important to highlight for folks the, the diversity of authorship of this book in that you have an executive leader in Ron Price, you have an academic who has implemented it in, in a number of roles, uh, but in Professor Tim, and then you have a consultant in Evans Baya. 
So when you come at it from a person who is in, you know, Evan's case, going into a, a multitude of different companies to uh, help implement strategy, when you have it from an academic standpoint, there's research and study and practice, and then you have it from from in, in Professor Tim's place, and then in Ron's place, you have it from being the CEO and leading the company, you get this rich approach that you don't get from just one viewpoint. So I think that's the that's one of the beauties of this. But w- when you think about it from that standpoint, what what are some of the to- other tools, in addition to what Professor Tim told us about, what are some of the other tools that you use when you go inside of a company to help start in this stage one process of found- laying a foundation? Well, on the purpose side, I think it's getting people to tell stories. And it could be stories about the past or the present or their anticipated future. And then you look in those stories for what are the common enduring themes and you begin to develop those. So this mm-hmm. is, this part is a very qualitative, intrinsic part of the strategy process. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, Dale, one of the things that we'll end up talking about is that you tend to oscillate back and forth between creative thinking and analytical thinking mm-hmm. as you move through strategy. Mm-hmm. And in, in each stage, you identify, is this stage intended to be more creative and intrinsic, or is it mm-hmm. intended to be more analytical and systemic? Mm-hmm. And as you, as you see and recognize what's happening there, one of the big ahas for us was that if you can recognize which people do better in those components and organize them accordingly, you're going to have more success. Some people get very frustrated speaking at a very philosophical, theoretical level. Other people are inspired by it. So we want to take advantage of of what each person's natural tendency is. Mm. And um, that's when you talk about tools, I would say the most powerful tool is the people involved in the conversation Mm. and understanding how they can contribute. One of the things that you will see in the three elements of the foundation is we have tried to give what are the characteristics of each one of them, whether it is purpose, whether it is vision, whether it is um, uh, core values we give the characteristics to look for, or that define that uh, particular part of the element. But we also give you a how, how to do it. And we give for each one of the elements, how you can create a good purpose statement, how you can create a good vision statement, which I believe is very useful uh, to anyone who is trying to create any of these elements. Very practical questions for you to answer for each of those components. Yes. yes. So I'm glad you went the people route because this idea of people so important and such a focus of the idea of, of being sound foundational. So um, what type of people are going to be thriving in this first stage? Because I have, the, you have different, you want to make sure that you're leveraging your talent throughout the seven stages and people are going to, you're going to find people have strengths in each of the stages. So what kind of talents are we going to leverage in this first stage? Well, I think first of all, you're looking for people who love futuristic thinking. Mm -hmm. So they love imagining what the future may become. You're looking for people who are great at talking and thinking at a conceptual or a philosophical level because you're looking for creativity and heart when you talk about purpose. Purpose eventually becomes very practical, but it doesn't start there. It starts with a deep look into Mm. how are we going to change the world as an organization? Mm. How are we going to make the world a different place than it would have been without us? Mm. So you're, you're wanting people who are attracted to that kind of a conversation And in fact, we have tools that help to identify who those people are. Mm. And so in the strategy work that we do, we start by uh, having people complete these online assessments that map out their natural tendencies and their skill development and where they get their greatest fulfillment in their work. And we intentionally, we don't have only that kind of person involved in stage one, but we intentionally overload stage one with people who are the big picture thinkers who are the visionaries, who are conceptual thinkers, and who have this sense of, I want to change the world in in my way. Those are the people that will help you to get great, deep, 
and lasting results in this stage. I want to add the fact that uh, we also want to look at people who are customer focused. Because uh, at the end of the day, particularly with the purpose, you have to think about the customer. Uh, similarly with vision, you have to think about your customer. Even with core values, uh, your core values are very important <clears throat> to how you treat your customer. So customer focus is another skill that we require. So I want to, we're, we're running short on this podcast, Dale. I want to make a few comments about values and vision before we finish up. First of all, values are how we go about doing things. They're how we get things done and the kind of standards or traits that we commit to live up to. Mm -hmm. And um, you've heard the phrase that nobody's above the law. When it comes to values, we're saying that everybody, no matter what their status, no matter what their level of authority or responsibility, is going to commit to aspire and live by these values. And I'm going to give you a shortcut for the discussion about values that comes from my years of fascination with something called formal axiology. I believe that great value statements need to cover three things. And you may have more core values, but you may be able to capture them in just three. These three things that great value statements should include involve how you're going to treat people, mm. how you're going to relate to performance, mm. and how you're going to relate to your purpose or stay true to your purpose. And I think that great value statements will touch those at least, maybe some more, but at least those three and I don't know if you followed the same kind of a pattern, Prof, but that's really been helpful for me as I'm listening to people mm. go through the discussion about values and to make sure that we've covered the values that will last. What I would want to add, uh, Dale, is uh, that uh, one of the focuses for us is people. And what we want mm. to do with these three elements is we try to make sure that people's purposes in life people's values and their vision should be aligned to what the organization wants to do. So that alignment between uh, people's vision, purpose, and values to those of the organization is very important for us. And we we'll bring that out as much as possible in the book. Yeah, we have so much more that we could say about that. Last of all, um, a little bit about vision. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to develop vision that we write about in the book. And once again, as we do with every stage, some very practical steps for you to go through in developing vision. Mm. I think of what are the big areas of value creation for your organization. Can you define what those should look like? And you can look out five, three years, five years, 10 years. We, we, we even have what we call our mad scientist group that looks out 30 years mm. in thinking about vision around these areas of value creation, then we like to ask the question, what do we want the world to be saying about us 10 years from now? Mm. How do we want, if we're in the media, how do we want the media writing about us? What do we want our customers saying about us 10 years from now? Mm. And then the second question to answer is, what do we want our employees and our shareholders to be saying about mm. us 10 years from now? Mm. And those are great questions. When you ask those questions around the areas where you know you're creating value, they really help to stimulate a wonderful conversation mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. vision. And a lot of people would say, why would you even think about vision 10 years out? Because things are changing so fast. I actually can go back and look at places where we've done this in the past, and they had 10 years to play out. And it's amazing to me how mm -hmm. much they hit the key points that they needed to know about to navigate the changes that mm -hmm. took place. For instance, I have one uh, situation with somebody that I helped them develop their 10-year vision in 2006. So I could go back and look in 2016. You know what they had down in 2006? We want to know how to navigate remote work. We want to know how to work in a hybrid environment. They had no idea where we would be in 2022. Mm -hmm. But because they had that vision, they were ahead of the rest of their competitors. Right. Absolutely. So uh, just... A, a brief response because we are out of time on this, but when we do this stage well, what does it look like? What are some of the, oh, we've won here kind of.
This is part of laying the foundation. So the book, Optimizing Strategy for Results, you can learn more. You can see the, the diagrams we've been talking about referring to at Optimizing Results. Uh, OptimizingStrategyForResults.com, OptimizingStrategyForResults.com, all one word. Uh, the authors, Professor Tim, Ron, Evans Baya, and uh, it is a fantastic read for you. This is an ongoing conversation around optimizing strategy for results. We're going to take this step-by-step, stage-by-stage. Today was stage one. Next time, As we have this conversation, we'll dive into stage two. And with that, Professor Tim, Ron, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I'll encourage folks, wherever you're consuming this content, make sure and rate and review. We would definitely appreciate that. Uh, And subscribe if you have not done so already. If you're at YouTube, you know all those things to do. Hit the thumbs up, uh, hit the notification button, ring the bell. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, make sure that you have uh, you've liked the podcast and reviewed it if available. We definitely appreciate that. This is the Complete Leader Podcast. Everything you need to become a high performing leader. Thanks for listening to the Complete Leader Podcast. Find more online, thecompleteleader.org. 